This is the toughest intro I may have had to have, ma have made in, in all this time, maybe from Glenn Close to Formula One World Championship drivers. Uh, I get to introduce one of the world's leading genetic, human genetic scientists, but also an old classmate of mine um, back at the Harvard University for troubled youth. No, she was not, I was a troubled youth. So Professor, Dr. Anthea Letsu, um, from Lowell, Mass, to, An uh, to Andover, to Harvard, to Yale, to Princeton. Um, she has checked all the boxes of, of an elite institution and has led this very powerful life of healing and human exploration through the sciences. I, I hadn't, Anthony, Anthony, I talk every, every 40 years or so, uh, but we, I tried to catch up with her last week before, before we went on. on and, and she reminded me that um, when she was in college, she wanted to be a photographer. Um, and, you know, I was trying to make sense of that and trying to make sense of, of her trajectory. And, and really um, what Anthea has done is, is in a way that's paralleled by very few people on the planet is to see the world with highest level of scientific uh, precision, but to go about it in this really poetic, dynamic way in the green room. Uh, she said that uh, in some ways genetics is, is asking the question, what is our destiny? Uh, who are we? Where do we come from? Where do we go? So she's, because she's risen to such a high level, she's on this, nexus point between high science and uh, questions of the spirit and human meaning. Uh, when I was preparing for these remarks, Anthony, Anthony, I was like, okay, who can I, who can I lean on? And I thought about William Blake, who hundreds of years ago in the auguries of innocence, uh, the opening four lines are to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Um, that is uh, Anthea's charge as a scientist to see the larger world in small things, including uh, Drosophila. Um, she is known um, amongst the cognoscenti as the diva of Drosophila and the magistrate of Melanogaster, I can't even say it, the other part of that, that little creature, Melanogaster, the magistrate of Melanogaster. Now, I'm, I am so proud, I'm, I'm so excited um, to have her speak. Um, so much of what she does, again, it resonates with poetry to look at symmetries and asymmetries. I was looking at some of her research and uh, it talked about Scylla and Charybda um, out of uh, the Odyssey, um, using poetic um, comparisons that, that talked about the Straits of Messina between Italy and Sicily, and then bringing it to bearing in, term, in terms of understanding metabolism and cell growth. Um, Anthea is really uh, just a, an intellectual titan uh, who wears her brilliance very lightly. She's just uh, you know, in college, I just, I told her, I just remember, remembered her as just somebody who just had the warmest spirit and the brightest of intellects. And she's turned it into just a, a brilliant career. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the great scientist, my friend, uh, Professor Anthea Letsu. Ivan, thank you. And, and thank you, students. And that was, Ivan, that was the most eloquent and gracious introduction I have ever received in my life. And so I very much appreciate that. Um, and uh, don't let Ivan fool you. He was, he was, he's a, <laughs> a great intellect um, himself. And, and uh, I was incredibly honored to be his friend when I was in college. So um, it's nice to have this reunion 40 years, 40, Five years later, I think, or you know, since we first met, almost forty-five years. So we're we're old. You guys are young. You have the whole world in 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 you know at at your feet, and as as you look forward. So um, 
one, I did want to thank you guys. And uh, I did a little research on the school over, you know, since I've been invited to talk here. And I, I watched a number of, of videos that Anna sent to me. And boy, did I enjoy them. And boy, did I sort of have fond memories of my own youth. So what I'm going to try and talk to you about today or uh, is just tell you the story of of my life from you know when I was your age to how I got to where I am now. And then we'll just talk about a couple of fun experiments that, that I've done. And I think sort of the take home message from, from my talk to you guys as youngsters or as young students is really to, you know, as you think about what you're gonna do with your life, you know, it's never too early to start thinking about it but don't pin yourselves down. And I think the story, my story really is, is to expose yourself to as much as you can and don't look toward a job, but look toward your passion and then have a career. And I think that the other important message that I have is none of us get to this end point by ourselves. There are important people in your life um, your teachers, your family. And in that group of people that you're exposed to, there's a, a very special group of people who are mentors. And these are people who not only educate you, but really help you, you know, they provide you with information, but they go beyond that. And none of us make it without, without making these connections with people who care about us in a special way and sort of sponsor our success. They give us things, they help us. They write our letters of recommendation in a very personal way. Okay, so um, can I share my screen and um, show you guys some pictures? I think we can do that. Let me make sure you have that ability. It looks like you do. Okay. If you try it, it should work. Let's try let it me, out. Let me, um, let me, let me first, um, ah, wait a minute. Take me a second here. I should That's have tried right. to take your time. I want to make sure it's in slideshow mode for you guys so you don't see everything. Okay, now I'll share my screen. Make sure that. Okay, do you see my name and? Yes, perfect. Okay, so that's, um. You know, and I sp talked about mentorship and on my, I hope that Anna and Ivan will share with you guys my contact information. So if there's anything, you know, if you're writing a paper about in your science class and you want to talk to an expert, um, please read, always feel, feel comfortable in reaching out to me. I, I love kids, I love teaching. And so there I am, case, case you need me. So let's see, how do I get, okay. I'm going to tell you about my life. That's me on the left when I was a little kid in Lowell, Massachusetts. My mother used to bundle me up. And on the right, you know, Ivan said that I was known as a diva of Drosophila. That's not exactly true. I'm known as the fly lady in, in Salt Lake City. So there I am looking in the mirror and I've grown up to be the fly lady. And that's what my children's friends used to call me because I used to teach their science classes and I'd bring, science, I'd bring, I'd bring flies into the classroom. So in the community, I'm not a diva, I'm simply the fly lady. So how did I get from you know, little, this little kid in Lowell, Massachusetts to a professor at the University of Utah? Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my roots. Everybody likes a story. Ivan mentioned that I grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts. And Lowell is, so Lowell, Massachusetts is about 20, mi 20 um, minutes north of Boston. It's an old mill town. So this is what it looked like in the 70s when I was a kid. Um, the mills of Lowell were deteriorating they were being bombed and burned, you know, the old, the old mill owners, you know, the, the buildings were worth nothing. So they were burning and people were setting them on fire and it was just vandalism. Now those buildings in Lowell, and, and, and the mill town was established in Lowell in the, 
mid 1800s. And it was basically the cotton from the South came up to the North and the looms, you know, the textiles were created in cities like Lowell that were built um, on the rivers because hydraulic power powered the mills. And the mills in the early 1800, who were the workers in the mills? The mills were, were um, staffed by the mill girls. These were farm girls from New England who came and they were the original workers in the mills. But, um, you know, in the late 1800s, in the early 1900s, our, our country was built on immigration, right? And so in the uh, first, the Irish came to, uh, came to Lowell and worked in the mills. And so you can sort of see the, mil the mills here in the 1800s. And now immigrants are the, um, are the workers and the workforce of the mills. Then in the 1920s or so, the, the Eastern Europeans, the Southern Europeans came and displaced, you know, the Irish, right? You know, the, the Northern Europeans raised in the social hierarchy, hierarchy. And then you had your Southern Europeans coming in. And my heritage is Greek. And here, here is sort of a, a family or some children who lived in the tenements of Lowell in about the 1920s. And it was their parents who were now working in the mills. And I show this picture um, because my grandparents, uh, my father's parents actually immigrated to, to Lowell in the 1920s. My father was born in 1929 and he grew up in these tenements in the mills. And my grandfather actually was lucky because he didn't lose the mill, many of the mill workers lost their jobs. The, the age of textiles um, sort of ended with the depression and everybody lost their jobs. My grandfather was a garbage collector, never lost his job. And uh, so, but you know, didn't have a lot of money and, 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 and he, he, he raised his family in the tenements. They valued education. My father uh, grew up in, in Lowell uh, along with his siblings. Uh, he got a scholarship to Harvard, went to Harvard Medical School, and um, but returned. He grew up with this idea of giving back to his community, and he came back to Lowell where he raised his family, not in tenements. I had a, a, a more privileged upper middle class upbringing, and uh, but he gave to me, you know, we all sort of get our spirits from our family and our friends, and he gave to me this 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 sense that I should give back to my community as I grew up. And that's part of why I ended up as a scientist. This is my, my uh, I grew, I went to public school through eighth grade and this is my middle school. So this is where I went to seventh and eighth grade. This is looked much worse when I was there. This is sort of a modern rendition of the school. It's still amazingly open. Uh, we had very few facilities and it was, you know, run with an iron hand. And the important thing to understand in, in my career growth, although, you know, I had every opportunity available to me as I grew up in terms of, uh, well, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but, you know, it was sort of when women were, I was on the bridge of when, you know, women were given the oppor same opportunities as, as uh, girls were given the same opportunity as boys. But in my school, uh, there were separate uh, girls play yards and boys play yards. I see you guys have co-ed wrestling. Uh, in this school, there was a line that was guarded between the girls play yard and the boys play yard. We actually had separate staircases so we couldn't bump into each other. Uh, Boys took shop, girls took cooking and sewing. So we took sewing in seventh grade. We made aprons to wear in our cooking class in eighth grade. But what I mainly remember about my, two things I mainly remember about my um, school when I was your age, guys, is that whenever we cooked anything good, we had to bring it over to the boys and let them have the cookies and the cakes. And we had to eat the corn chowder and the awful stuff that we made. But the boys got everything good. But I also rem remember the importance of, you know, doing well in school and applying yourself, um, applying yourself to your schoolwork. And, you know, when I was young, I always thought it was important to be the best. And, but I, you know, looking back, I think that 
you know, not everybody can be number one, and but you can be good enough and be very, very good. And just, it's important to, to take all these opportunities and try, and it's okay to fail, you know? It really is okay to fail, be, as long as you learn from that experience. Okay, so that's, 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 that's my, so as a kid, um, I had the support of my family. I received an education through the public school system. It gave me a, a sort of sense of community. community. And then um, I entered a more sort of a privileged educational experience. From uh, after eighth grade, I actually went to a, a boarding school in the Northeast. It was only 15 minutes from my, from my home but I went to Phillips Academy. And this is where the story of opportunity for girls and boys begins. I was in the very first class, Andover, the year I, before I went was all boys. I was in the very first class of girls at Phillips Academy. And there were only 25 of us boarding, uh, boarding students. So girls in the audience, just take it, just always lean in a little bit. But um, when I was growing up, uh, I was always in the minority at Andover. Uh, there was one girl for every four boys when I first started and the numbers have crept up to 50% now, now. So that's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, at Andover, uh, again, I, I always paid attention to my academics, but I was surprised actually when I looked back in preparing for this talk. Um, at Andover, I actually never took biology, which is what I grew up to be. I did take photography and I learned to be a photographer. And that's where I, and that was my first sort of laboratory experience was in a dark room. We didn't have digital photography. We took pictures with film. So at Andover, I became a photographer, one. Two, um, it's the time of Title IX, which um, guarantees to girls all the opportunities that boys have. So we started having um, all the sports that boys were provided with, girls got. So an important part of my Andover experience was actually sports. I learned the importance. Um, it's part of the Andover tradition, I think, the way at East Harlem School is to, to value um, a healthy lifestyle and to, we had to do sports every single day and uh, and it became part of my life. And I think that's really important not to sit at a desk all day to get out. And um, you can think more clearly too. And you can think while you're doing sports and you can be more creative. So all it's um, a lifestyle thing. And also the Equal Rights Amendment, people started talking about equal pay for women. And again, girls, listen up. You have to ask for these things. People are not gonna give you equal pay. So, Boys, you've got to do the same things as girls do. You got to ask for what you deserve. But girls, lean, you know, my 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 advice to you is lean in. You won't get it unless you ask for it. And that's an unfortunate truth. And you would have thought things have changed over the last 40 years, but we're still paid a little less than the guys are. Okay, so I went to Andover. I learned to be a photographer. I had my first lab experience. And um, from Andover, I did what a lot of kids do is I, I went off to Harvard. And in looking forward, and it's Harvard, it's at Harvard when I learned to be a biologist. I, um, is my screen still sharing appropriately with you guys? Did something yes, else? Yes, it is, it looks great. Okay. Um, I learned to be a biologist and uh, I started Harvard I think like many people do, again, you know, you're in college, you still don't know what you want to do. And I discovered uh, biology there. I started as a math major. So I was surprised in, in preparing for this talk to discover that I won the physics prize in high school. I had forgotten that. I was, I was into math and physics and I just liked problem solving, okay? So I, I saw math as puzzles and it was just something I could do and I enjoyed it immensely. But when I got to Harvard, I realized, you know, I needed to think about something that I could do that would, um, you know, be more than 
that was important to me in terms of giving back to a community. And so I really struggled finding the science that, that suited me best. And actually I did not take biology until my junior year at Harvard. I started out as a math major. I was trying to figure out, you know, what do I do? What do I do? I was a photographer still. I became the chairman of the, of the, um, of the, I was the photo chair of the Harvard Crimson. So I put out a newspaper and I, I enjoyed that immensely. I realized I probably couldn't make a living as a photographer. I took a genetic, you know, I was taking my science classes. I finally stumbled on one that really inspired me. Genetics, we were talking in the green room about this. It was a field that was just booming or beginning at those times. I found a lab, I worked in a lab, I got myself an experience in the bio labs at, at, um, at Harvard. I started out feeding the silkworms, which were a model system for, uh, for uh, development and genetics. And I studied, I learned, I sort of got exposed to a study, my thesis was on gene organization and evolution. And I, um, yeah, it was on gene evolution and my, my sponsors were Fotis Kafatis, who was a professor at the university and a postdoctoral fellow who was Tom Eichbush. And these people really took an interest in me and guided me toward graduate school, along with my mother, because as I told Ivan, my father wanted, he had three children and he wanted three physicians as, you know, so that's sort of why I was in science. And as I told Ivan, you know, I did take biology. I was kind of pre-med. I did take biology, but I kept, every time you had to dissect something, I fainted at the sight of blood. So I kept hitting my head, you know, as I hit the floor. <laughs> and so in part, it was what I couldn't do and didn't want to do uh, was to be a doctor. So uh, I, I found my passion in genetics. And uh, what I learned was you, as a science major, you didn't have to just be a doctor. There were other opportunities. You could go to graduate school. So I did go to graduate school. I went to graduate school in human genetics, as I've been told you, and I went to Yale. And at Yale, my sponsor, my mentor was a man named Michael Lisquet, Mike Lisquet, who had other passions. He was an avid fisherman. And, uh, you know, getting, so I got my PhD and the important thing to do when you, you learn how to do science, you learn how to do an experiment, much like you guys probably do in science fair. You develop hypotheses, you test them. And you know, the projects are probably a little bit bigger than you do in science fair, but you know, not that much. You guys are starting out, uh, but you need to publish papers. And what I learned in graduate school now, I was an expert, I could do experiments, but what do you do for a job, right? you can do a lot of things with a PhD in, in any of the sciences. You can become a professor, an academic professor like I did. You can become a, um, you can become an editor. You can become a journalist at the New York Times. I was telling um, the students in the green room in Ivan that if you're interested in science, read the Science Times on Tuesdays. It's written so that most of you guys can understand it. Sixth to eighth grade, you should have no problem with those articles if you, if you love science. And it'll, it'll help you just understand what scientists are thinking about in a timely fashion. So you can be a science editor. You can go into, you can go into industry. Uh, you can, you know, Troy, you told me you wanted to be a physical therapist. You can actually get a PhD in physical therapy too. And then, you can be a practitioner of physical therapy and you can also do research, right? Um, you can write about it. You can become, you can go work for the government as I have a little bit as well as a consultant at the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation. There are so many things that you can do as a scientist that to be honest, I was not aware of until I was quite far along in college. So I think it's really important and I didn't tell you guys this, that they pay you to do your PhD in the scientists, sciences. So um, you actually go to school for, your, you know, once you finish college, I, and I didn't know this, I thought I was gonna pay for my degree, you pay for everything else, right? But they actually give you a stipend, you know, so, so our graduate students are making almost $30,000 a year now. 
and they don't have to pay their tuition. And so it's sort of like a job while you're getting an education that allow you to get an even better job. So I think that's important to know. Um, after you finish your PhD, you actually, if you wanna take the route that you can get a job, or if you want to be a professor, uh, you have to do a little bit more training. So you do a postdoctoral fellowship. So I was trying to decide what do I want to study? And I decided I wanted to be a developmental biologist. So I went and worked with um, Shirley Tillman at, um, at uh, Princeton in the Lewis Thomas lab. And the point that I want to make here is that um, oftentimes in the careers that we choose, and I was a woman in science, there aren't people that look like us to be mentors, right? And this could be gender, it can be our skin color, it can be all sorts of things. And actually, I think it's inspirational to have a mentor who looks like you. So Shirley looked more like me than any other mentor, which is not to say that the other people who I worked with were not terrific and, and inspirational, but there was something very special about having Shirley as my mentor. You know, she had the same problems I did. Um, she was young with young children. And, and, and it was just, I think, having someone that looks like you as a mentor, if you, can, if you can swing it, I encourage you to do that or at least make that type of contact and have one of those people in your network as you, as you grow up and think about what you wanna do with your life. So I worked for Shirley for a couple of years and she was just an amazing woman. She went on to be um, the president of, of Princeton. And so this is also to tell you that in, in terms of if you be a professor, you can go into administration and get leadership roles that are a little unrelated to maybe what you thought you were going to do. So that's Shirley. And then, you know, life, in, life sort of got in the way. I loved being in Shirley's lab, but I, um, had met my husband in graduate school and he was in Texas. So uh, I did what I took one for the team and I moved to Texas. So um, also when I was working in Shirley's lab, I had decided I wanted to be a developmental biologist and mouse was one of the um, key organisms that we use as developmental biologists. But again, that fainting problem kept intervening. So I switched to an organism that didn't bleed, the fruit fly. And so uh, with my move to Texas, I got a husband. Well, you know, that's an awful way to say it, but I, I, I got married and I, uh, I, you know, I started my family life and I started my, my research on the fruit fly. And you guys, now we're gonna talk a teeny bit about science. Um, and again, I have to give credit to my mentor, Steve Wasserman, uh, who, as a postdoc, he gave me the research tools to start my own lab. And the important thing about the fruit fly, you guys, is that they share 70% of their DNA with us. We are made of the same thing. We have the same blueprint. They have, they have a digestive tract, as do we, and the same genes that build our digestive tract build the fruit fly digestive tract. They have a nervous system. They respond to sensations just like we do. So if I can understand how a nervous system is built in the fly, I will understand how the nervous system is built in the human. I haven't talked about um, symmetry and asymmetry. One of the things I've studied is how an organism has asymmetry. So how is our, our front different from our back? And what are the genes that set up that axis? And that's really been a uh, sort of a, a central point of the research that I've done. And so body organism in the fly, exactly the same as body organisms in the human and so on. So basically that, and the beauty of the fly is, do I have the slide in there? Well, the beauty of the fly is that embryonic development takes 24 hours compared to nine months in a human. So I can, it's an experimental uh, window that works in my career lifespan and in my students' lifespan. So I moved to Dallas. So now I, you know, I've spent my whole life on in the in the East Coast, but for for love and of uh, for love and for uh, passion for my science, 
now I'm in Dallas, Texas of all places. And I encourage you guys to leave the Northeast. You know, we have a little bit of a Northeast centric uh, a view of life and, and it's good to get out and see other things. And so I wanna, don't, I wanna leave time for questions. So I'll wrap up very quickly and sort of say that I ended up, my husband and I found jobs uh, when it came time and we became professors uh, at the University of Utah. And I have a lab, there I am a few years ago in my lab. And this is the building that I work in and it's a genetics institute. And so our staircase is the double helix. It's, it's meant to um, inspire this double helix. So we have this beautiful staircase and then all this shared space in our labs uh, in the building. And I have a gorgeous view. That's my office right up here, if you can see my cursor, <clears throat> on the seventh floor. And uh, we look out over the valley and valleys to the west and mountains to the east. And I should say, you know, that Andover um, spirit of um, healthy lifestyle, I use the stairs to get up to my office on the seventh floor. I come in on the sec second floor, so it's really only six flights, but it's quite a hike. But it was a good thing I did that because, you know, during the pandemic, I'm working mostly from home, but we weren't allowed to, you know, be more than one person in the elevator. So it was quicker to use the stairs. That's the view. This is the University of Utah. This is where I work. And here's the University of Utah. Here's the valley, you guys. Here are the mountains where I can look out and I can see my students biking and hiking when they should be in lab. These are my students. They like me because one ha Halloween, they all dressed up like me for Halloween. That's, you know, I used to, that's what I used to look like, right? So um, these are the people that I teach. I don't teach in the classroom. I have students who do research in my lab. This is my lab. Um, be when I first moved into it, uh, the building was new. So um, it's wonderful. I, you know, they gave me all this space. They gave me students. I was hired by this man, Mario Capecchi, who um, won the Nobel Prize. He's the person who got the Nobel Prize for uh, manipulating genomes. And you guys have maybe heard about CRISPR-Cas9 and homologous recombination. He's the man who brought us that. And you know, if I can, I will try and get him to speak to you guys. He, um, he has an incredible life story. His mother, when he was four and a half years old in Italy, his mother was um, put in a, in a uh, start of World War II. His mother, he lost his mother to a concentration camp. She was imprisoned in Dachau because for, uh, for anti-fascist pamphlet, pamphlet, pam, pamphlet hearing, whatever. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm misspeaking here. But he was put in a, and, um, she, she was from a wealthy American family and she left money with a farm family to take care of Mario. He was four, four and a half years old. They didn't take care of him and he was a, a street urchin. He lived on the streets of Italy um, and he was, his mother found him after the war in a hospital starving to death you know, in a, in a hospital at the, about the age of eight and brought him back to the United States. His story is remarkable and, and he wins the Nobel Prize. So he's truly a spectacular scientist. And um, I bet we could get him to talk to you guys. Uh, and then just very briefly, I am a fruit fly geneticist. You know, this is, this is what I grew up to be. And I work with model organisms. So you guys, if you want to do development, uh, we study in all sorts of animals, bacteria, viruses, this type of research led to the, the vaccine for COVID, yeast, the other model organisms that we like to use as developmental biologists, frogs, mouse, fish, and then my favorite organism is the fruit fly. Uh, I told you that it's a wonderful genetic organism because it has a short um, embryogenic period, only 24 hours. And the other nice thing about the fruit fly is that single females can produce thousands of organisms. So as geneticists, we need big families and multiple generations. So that's why it's a powerful organism. Uh, we won't talk about this. I thought I'd show you a, a, an experiment 
that you might enjoy that we did in my lab one time showing you the power of genetics uh, these days. And this is what a normal fly looks like. It's got big red eyes. And my students and I took an embryo and we injected it with a gene for green, for fluorescent protein that would be expressed in the eye. That gene was taken up by the fruit fly genome and we created flies with glowing green eyes. Isn't that cool? So this is actually a fly that we made in my lab for a different reason, but I thought it would be fun to show you that. And then I will only sort of say that the life of an academic is truly one of the most wonderful lives I can imagine. Um, we get to play in the lab and do experiments, which are of value to humankind, but they're personally fulfilling as well. It's fun to test an idea. Um, it's important to share our ideas and communicate these our findings with the public. And you know, one aspect of being a scientist is we have to beg for money that uh, to support our our pipe dreams and ideas. And we do that from the United States is pretty good about uh, granting having lots of money available to scientists, the National Institute of Health and the National Science Foundation. And also one of the things that I do is I give money out as I serve as a consultant of the National Science Foundation. So that's way too much information, you guys, but that's my life in a little bit more than 20 minutes. Thank you. It was brilliant and phenomenal. I, I, I didn't know so much of this. I mean, we had gotten your bio, but to hear it from with your voice, I, I, I am astounded and proud. And we got, they, the kids have, have done their research and looked at, uh, they know, um, a lot about so they've got some phenomenal questions. But 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 what a what a pleasure that was. Hit me with those questions, guys. Will do. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, as Ivan Thank said. You. And and I, and if, you, <laughs> if you want to remove your screen share, oh, I'll, yes, no worries. Right. I'll be able to spotlight um, our first student. So thank you so much. Your first question comes from Zaida. Hi, Zaida. There you are. Hi, good morning. I would like to thank you for being a part of our speaker series today. I aspire to one day study neurology and I read that you are part of the Society for Neuro Neuroscience and I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how you are interested in neuroscience and in what ways it relates to human genetics. Oh, what a wonderful question. And I didn't really talk about my neuroscience. My neuroscience project that I did in my lab I'll tell you very a little bit about it in a second, was a result of a student that came to me and wanted to study neuroscience in the fly. So it was really something that I did with a student and it was student driven. But there is a disease in humans that, um, just a tragic disease. So it's called adrenoleukodystrophy and Ivan, you know, Anna's probably too young. I Ivan might remember a, a movie called uh, Lorenzo's Oil. That's the disease that, that we study in the lab. And the so it, children are born and they look totally normal. And it's tragic because they die. They basically die by the age of 10. And they sort of first lose their ability to control their behaviors. And then they lose their ability to walk. And they become wheelchair bound and they die. There's no cure for that disease. We were able to knock out, we know the gene that's responsible for that disease in humans. We knocked it out in the fly and we showed that we had what we call a shared loss of function phenotype. So flies that are missing that disease that children are missing also show neurodegeneration. And so then we were able to use that model to show how diet can rescue or cure the disease in the fly. So the next step for a, a project like that, and we're not the people to do it, but we publish that result. And then the people who work in mouse and in humans and primates can try to replicate our cure in an organism that's even more closely related to the human being. So we step our way. We start with the most basic um, animal, which is a fly. And then 
we make our discoveries as in terms of cures and capabilities in the fly, and then we step our way up the evolutionary ladder. So my, yeah, so it, it goes back to that slide I showed you. Everything is conserved in the fly, and it's a very powerful and easy model to work with. And that project actually was incredibly satisfying to me, you know, as a neurologist, because you can see how it can really impact human life and make it and make a, a, a make a change in many, many people's lives. Does that answer your question? Thank you so much for that. And we'll go to our next one. It comes from Sitlali, who's here at school with us. Hi. Hi, good morning. I read that along with being a professor in human genetics department at the University of Utah, you are also involved in a lot of research about human genetics. How do you manage your time as both a professor and a researcher? <sighs> okay. This is what I tell my children. There's always enough time in the day to accomplish those things that you care about. So, you know, it's all about priorities. And I would say that I'm tired a lot of the time, more as I've gotten older. But, um, you know, sort of, so in terms of research, as uh, a lot of my students do a lot of my research for me. And I do a lot, the way a professor works as you sort of climb the ranks is that, you know, when I was training, I was myself doing a lot of the experiments when I was younger. And as I've sort of progressed, you know, in my promotion mode from assistant professor to associate professor to full professor, you saw a, I, have, I have more and more students. So I write the grants and I get the money so that the experiments can be done and I can turn my attention to experimental design, human genetics, and you know, um, starting programs when I was at the NSF for, for other people to do research. And my own research is done in collaboration with my students. So as a scientist, when we publish, my students are always the first author of the paper. And when I was young, I was in the first position that says, I did all the work. And then the person, now I have the senior position in my authorships, which sort of says, I'm the person the ones who sort of design, who, who takes responsibility for the design of the experiments because my students do a lot of that um, as well. And you really become part of it. As you progress, you become uh, the team leader. You're always part of a team and it's just your position in that team. Are you sort of the team leader? Are you the team doer? And they're all incredibly important roles and they just change as we get older. Thank you. And so that's much. how, as you get older, you can accomplish more things because your teammates are, are working as well. Thank you. We'll go next to Vanessa who has a question for you. Hi, Vanessa. Hi. I have read in your biography that you had the opportunity to attend and study at prestigious universities like Harvard and Yale. Can you tell us a little about the process of applying to universities and how you made the decision to attend the universities that you did? Well, as I told I then, uh, I, I will answer the question, uh, but only by saying that, you know, my father as a child said I could go to any university I wanted to, but if it was Harvard, he'd pay. So I, <laughs> but okay. So I think that, um, what do I think about all this? You know, my, 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 I did attend very prestigious universities. And I think, as I sort of said in my biography that, you know, I was a competitive little kid when I was an academic. I think it's really important to set your sights on a goal and whatever that goal is, do everything you can to achieve that goal. So to get into Harvard, you know, I think when Ivan and I were there, and I don't think it's changed at all. You really need to achieve in the classroom, the best that you don't have to, be, and, and, and it's true, you absolutely don't have to be the best, but you need to demonstrate excellence 
in academics is a given. And you need to, I, de I think, um, especially nowadays, also exhibit passion and commitment to something. It really doesn't matter what that thing is, but you really have to, you know, keeping your nose in the books isn't, isn't quite enough. And I think what we're looking for now as academics at, um, for, for these things is, um, like I sort of said, a commitment to community, I think, is incredibly important. Uh, your guidance counselors can probably advise you. So, and I, so, but I think, um, you know, you can't decide at the last minute you want to go to Harvard. You can't decide at the last minute that you want to do anything. You can't, you've got to make a plan and um, you've got to make a plan and stick to that plan. And you got to have a plan B. Because even if you do everything right, it might not happen for you. And I think you've got to be a little bit resilient. And um, yeah, that's sort of, so I was forced into it. Good thing that my father's goals matched my goals. <laughs> but you have to remember, you know, he had done it from, he from poverty, right? And he had achieved this and he wanted the same thing for his children, but he didn't want, you know, he just didn't want them to struggle. I will also sort of say that, that I think that, um, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's what I'll sort of say. And I will also sort of say there are good places that aren't attached to those names as well. There are smart people everywhere and you, there are opportunities everywhere. And you can achieve um, careers, successful careers without going to Harvard or Yale. Thank you so much. That was all such great advice. Uh, we'll go next to Alexa. Hi, Alexa. good morning. Hi, Alexa. Um, I think the study of human genetics is really interesting. What is something that everyone should know about human genetics? But it's no way. My, my Alexa is talking to me. I'm sorry. Can you, can you, can you repeat your question? Oh yeah. Wait. Can you hear me? Yeah. Now I can hear you. Okay. Sorry. No, it wasn't your fault. Okay. I think the study of human genetics is really interesting. What is something that everyone should know about human genetics, but is not widely known? Oh, that is a good question. I think, I think, I don't know that it's not widely known, but I think the important discussion in human genetics now is what are we gonna do with this frightening capacity to manipulate our genomes? So I think we don't know the answer to that. So I think eighth graders, sixth graders, you probably know about CRISPR and the fact that we now have the capability and we do it routinely. I do it in flies. I change their genetics. I create mutants, right? That's what I do as a geneticist. We create mutants. As human geneticists, we try to make things better. We cure disease. But what is better, right? You know, is it taller? Is it stronger? Do we have the right to even think about changing those things in our population? I don't have the answers. Nobody has the answers. And I think you guys, it's your generation that is going to have to have these discussions uh, and provide guidelines. My generation has given you guys the technology to do some awesome, scary things. Your generation has to find the answers to what we're going to do. And, you know, it's very important to recognize that even though we come up with guidelines, there are going to be people who break the rules. You know, that's who are going to, we're going to say this line, this is a line you cannot cross. But I have the technology to cross that line. 
can you really stop me? So these are important, important questions in human, and these are human genetic questions. We do it without a second thought in model organisms. We manipulate genomes. We can do it in humans. We, well, one person actually has made a CRISPR baby in China and um, that was condemned worldwide, but it has happened and we really need to think about that as a, as a society. So it's a scary question actually, Alexa. And, um, but most of us are good people, we'll figure it out. Thank you so much. We wanna be mindful of your time this morning. Do you have time for one or two more questions? I do, I do, I'm happy. I, Wonderful. I'm happy to be here. Oh, great. All right, well, we're gonna go, come next to Troy, who you saw earlier in the green room. Hi, Troy. Hi. All right. What are some of your favorite classes that you've taught while working in the Department of Human Genetics at the University of Utah? And why were they your favorite? I can tell you what my favorite class that I taught. I've taught a lot of classes. Um, my absolute favorite class was, and this sort of goes back, it was Dilemmas in Developmental Biology. And this was a class that I taught to students along with um, a Har another Harvard classmate of mine actually from way back when. But what we did was we gave students two papers, two scientific papers in which the scientific process was, um, was good. There was nothing questionable, but they got different results, right? And this is sort of how you interpret data. And it was a class in which we challenged students to come up with ways to resolve these dilemmas in the scientific process. So I enjoyed it because students got to think there was no right answer, there was no wrong answer. And it really revealed, I think, to, to the instructors, to me and to the students, how, um, how perceptions and, and the difference between facts and truths. And I think that's an important thing to understand um, as a scientist. So it was a it was a class that I enjoyed because it taught us how to think. And it's a little more fun than memories memorizing facts, which is necessary to sometimes. But that's the class I liked the best. Great, thank you so much. And we'll go to our final question. It comes from Geraldine. Hi, Geraldine. Hi. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to I I'd like to thank you for joining us for our virtual speaker series. Thank you. Um, and you have been able to accomplish so much success in your career and field of study. If you had the option to choose any other career path or field of study, what would it be and why? <laughs> I have two answers to that question. Uh, my secret dream actually the only, was to be a Supreme Court judge. <laughs> But I burned that bridge when I became a scientist in high school and, you know, when my father wanted to be it. Um, realistically, I think, and we've sort of, and, and it shares its passion. It shares a lot of things. I would have liked to have been an artist, some sort of creative person. And actually, as I look to my retirement, Geraldine, I have re-pulled out my camera. Last night I was in a photography class. I have pulled out my camera and when I become too old to be in the um, in the lab or you know sort of doddering with my students, I'm going I have started to sort of to do that, right? I would have liked to be an artist. And you know being an artist, I have no regrets about what I did. You know, I have second choices, plan Bs. And I think for me, I'm not a, I am a risk taker in that, you know, being a scientist is a little bit of a risky thing, but I got a paycheck every single day as a scientist. I think an artist is a very, very risky, risky uh, career. So I can do it, you know, now that I have a savings account, I put away from my old age, I've taken care of myself and my family and my kids. And I will, um, I'm going to be a photographer next in the time that has left. But I don't regret um, that I be, I, I actually, 
that's my other advice to all of you guys is to try to live your life so you don't have have regrets about your choices. And I don't. Thank you but so, no so much. Anything else. And I'll actually let me answer, answer say one other thing. I think you know, in terms of a career and a job, I've also tried to keep my career fresh and try to spice myself up every 10 years or so. That's why I went off to the NSF and did something a little bit different. And that's why I change my research projects. I, you know, I'm a developmental biologist. Someone asked me about my interest in, in neurobiology. It's fun to have a lot of things at your fingertips throughout life. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. This was so wonderful. We enjoyed everything that you shared with us. What we'll do is we'll just end with meditation um, just to take in everything that you shared. And then Ivan will offer some final remarks. So Geraldine, if you can could Before we do this, can I just really sort of say thank you to the students for um, their questions. That was really, um, really kind of you to, to sort of take the time to, to learn a little bit more about me and your questions were all so, so wonderful. And all the students, thank you for your time. It was our pleasure and, and our honor. Thank you so much. Okay, Geraldine. One, two, three. One, two, three. Thanks, Geraldine. What what a wonderful, wonderful uh, morning. I and mean, the most immediate reason I'm so grateful is that all of a sudden now I have some credibility because I, because you're my friend, I seem a lot smarter and nicer. It's like, how can, by association, April's like, yeah, I, Ivan is actually kind of decent because he knows somebody um, who is amazing as, as uh, our professor of human genetics, Anthea Letsu. Um, I, I was scribbling notes down furiously um, and because you range so easily and generously through uh, the realms of science and human relations and philosophy, um, uh, in our in our mission, I don't know if you've had a chance to see it, Anthea, but uh, the heart of the mission um, is to help people learn to adapt to change and to create and share lives of deep meaning, dynamic virtue and transcendent joy. And you embody that uh, to the greatest degree. Um, you're gentle and you're at the same time Promethean, um, you know, part philosopher, part shaman, part uh, healer, teacher. Um, and I don't know if you kids know, but Anthea, um, the, the, the name means flower. And so unconsciously, um, William Blake sang to my heart when I got to introduce this, this amazing intellectual and, uh, and stellar human being, um, you know, to see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Um, before you came on this morning, I, I don't wanna, I could go on forever about, you know, what, how powerful this was for all of us and for me as your friend. But uh, I've been reading the kids, The Little Prince, and the latest chapter is just about how things are ephemeral um, and, and how quickly um, um, time moves and how precious um, things and people, people are. And uh, I feel that even more, more now. I am so grateful that, that my students got to meet uh, this titan of science um, and this, this just wonderful incandescent human being. Um, so um, thank you, Anthea. Stay in touch with, with our school and, and, uh, and uh, oh, one other, two, two, one other thing. Um, you were talking, we talk a lot about friendship here. And uh, the Buddha said that there are two conditions uh, to reach enlightenment. And, and one of them is appropriate attention, focusing on things. And you spoke so wonderfully about that. And then the other one is admirable friendship. So if you have appropriate attention and admirable friendship, you will reach enlightenment. And I was so touched 
as you went through the slides and talking about your meteoric but also lasting trajectory as, as a person in science, that you had your people, your mentors there in the slides. That was so touching and humbling to me. And uh, you're just an inspiration uh, you know, for all of us to, about how to live a beautiful life. Um, so those are, those are my, my words of tribute that I'm gonna cut short now. I don't know if you have any final remarks, but, but you really made my day and, and my colleagues day. We're gonna be talking about you for a long time. And I hope you see yourself as part of our school family out here in the wild east of, of New York. I hope you guys will keep me in your hearts as well. I have so enjoyed getting to know, you know, Ivan, it's been, it's, well, first of all, Ivan, your comments are over the top gracious and just too kind. And, and you guys, you have a remarkable man at your helm. So I, I knew that from when I first met Ivan. And um, it's nice to see that that original impression has, has lasted a lifetime. So a remarkable man at your helm and um, take advantage of that and, 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 and keep, that, keep that in your hearts. And I am also very grateful students, Anna, Ivan, I, I love what you guys have. I was so happy to be part of it. And um, please, if, you know, when I'm in New York, let me visit, let me come see you and let me uh, be, be a little bit of a part of, of this wonderful thing that you guys all have. So um, thank you. I hope it goes beyond this, this hour. And I'm really honest, students, you know, for those of you who have questions about science, you know, need a second set of eyes on that paper your science teacher asks you to write. Please, please, I love students, I love kids. Um, reach out, keep in touch both ways. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Have a great much. weekend. Thank you so much, Anthea. Thank you, study hard, everybody.